How, welcome guys to How To. Uh, this is my mate Ben, say hello Ben. Hi guys, you alright? So we're gonna start off, just a quick introduction, not too long, just a bit of, just to get the page, obviously there's people who know you, but the, for the, someone who doesn't know you, who you are, what you're about, briefly. Yeah, so my name's Ben. Uh, I'm a recovered drug addict, two and a half years in. Um, I'm, a 12, I'm a 12 step recovered addict, and I live by those principles, but like I say, there's, there's people out there that aren't in 12 step that may relate to my experience and my recovery. So hopefully I can relate, get some sort of identification out there for you. Okay, so we open opening question, which we will get used to this. Do you believe in God? I do. I believe in a God of my, uh, my own understanding. Uh, I'll start out by saying that I, I have nothing against religion. Uh, people that have religion and faith there. They're very, very powerful lives. I believe in a God of my own understanding that's on a spiritual basis rather than a religious basis. Uh, again, I have no prejudice against religion. It's just purely my my concept of God. And that's changed over time. You know, when I first got clean, I had a concept of God. And as I've grown throughout the program and, I, and I've embarked on what we call a spiritual life, I've... I've rediscovered what God means to me. But yeah, to answer your question, boy, yeah. I that answered God. my question. I identify with that. So to speak to the layman or to speak to the person who in recovery, how did you foster your perception of God? So I'd start by saying, for me, I was desperate. You know, I was so desperate for a new way of life. And, you know, m many people probably identify with this, that I was at a point where... I didn't know how to live with or without the drugs and alcohol no more, you know. My using was at a point where I had no life and when I didn't use drugs and, you know, I tried to stay clean for a couple of days, my um, internally, you know, mentally, I, I was in a position and a place that I couldn't be and so I was broken, you know, and I came into into the, a way of life that demanded a belief in a power greater than me and you know and that concept was god and i had no problems with that because like i say i was desperate for a new way of life yeah i like that and i've got a friend you know who you are who says that like god people who find god and have god in their lives are weak people and i i tried to explain and struggle to see if you can do any better you've got to be on i had to be on the floor so and I'm, i've not found god in any sense but i'm fostering it because I, I see people who people who, who are attractive in the sense of i want what they've got recovery wise all have a relationship with god but how would you answer that so weak people uh, have god in their lives i would say that i was one of them people that thought believing in god is weak you know but the truth is is I was lucky enough to find a great sponsor. And if you don't know what a sponsor is, it's somebody that basically has been through the program of the 12 Steps of Recovery of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they have clean time behind them. And they take you through the work. And, you know, I was I was beaten so much into a state of reasonableness, which means I was beaten so much by the drugs and alcohol that I had to have this reasoning, which was, I can't do this on my own. You know, no matter how much I wanted to, no matter how much self-will I thought I had, that was never enough, you know, and there's many reasons that we should stop using drugs, you know, rather than not just consequences, but, you know, for children and for jobs and for all that kind of stuff. But nothing can until I, until I discovered that no human power can relieve me of what I suffer with and... I was fortunate enough that I was willing, you know, I was willing to believe in God. And that was the first the first breakthrough for me. I didn't need to believe. I just needed to be to be willing that there was something out there greater than me. And that willingness grew. And like I say, my concepts of God has changed over time. Yeah. And I just want to say I've missed the mark. So I'm just going to backtrack a little bit. I've, I first met Ben when I first come to Blackpool. Uh, I played footy with Ben. I've done a footy Friday post. So I met Ben on it. Um, on on this football, uh, I I actually made I'll tell you now I made a little judgment. Only I'm not really judgmental, but obviously <laughs> you make opinions, and I'll come to that in a bit. Um, I still do today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and 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 I'm aware I'm doing it. It wasn't a heavy one, but I made it, and I'll come to that in a minute. So that's how I know Ben. So it's a short relationship. It's going really well, but he's good. He's good. Uh, he's good fellowship. I can learn a lot from Ben. I'm, I, I, we're good friends at this moment in time. Definitely. So uh, I question. So we've not pondered it. I've not. I've not threw this at you. This is off the cuff. But I know you'll have pondered it. By the way, he's done on it. Was you born, or did you become an addict? What's your stance? For me, do you know what? Right, I, I've gone back and forth over over a long time with this, and 
very very straightforward it don't really matter does it now because i just am i got to a point where i thought is it going to change where i'm at in my life you know i'm in recovery i'm living a 12-step life whether i was born or whether it was you know nature or nurture isn't going to change it and you know what <laughs> I'm an overthinker, like most of us who, who suffer with what we do. We, we overthink everything and, you know, this programme is a simple programme and we like to over overcomplicate things. And I like to do that in my life anyway, you know, I like to overcomplicate everything. And over time I've learned to just be simple and simplify things. And the point is to answer your question, like, it doesn't change it where I am now. So to me, it doesn't matter. You know, I don't know is the answer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, so you've just said the word program. Can you explain? So, so someone's, someone's into recovery and they're saying, listen, uh, you need to get some recovery. You start doing what we've been in that process. We've had family, friends, uh, professionals. But so like, I'm speaking, uh, this is the modern way for me. So if someone goes on YouTube, seeing this for the first time, how to, and uh, what would you explain what a program is, Alan? Can you give you a definition of what, what a common day is for you? Yeah, on of course your program? I can. First of all, what you're saying about the YouTube, it, it's, it's, it's a great platform, isn't it? Because you know, I can log on to YouTube and I can find a, a how-to video on anything in my life, you know, how to put my me, me dishwasher together or so. This should be no different, you know. It's, so for me, pro, the program of recovery starts by going through the 12 steps now i'm not going to go into like what the 12 steps are in too much detail because there might be people out there that don't want to go down that way of life right now but for me a way of life looks like this i wake up in the morning and again i'm not I'm not sh uh, shy to say that i believe in my god of my own understanding so every day i get on my knees and i pray and i don't pray for for myself i don't pray you know i used to pray for things like you know, more money from my job or a nicer car or whatever that may be. I pray for the the knowledge from God to give me his will, not my will. So basically what that means is what would he have me do today? You know, and that's, you know, basic spiritual principles that we live in this program, which is without using lingo, simple things, being kind to one another, being honest, like rigorously honest, you know, that was a struggle for me through my addiction. I were, I were a consistent manipulator and liar. Um, I live on those principles of, of love and tolerance to all, you know, even if there's, I'm in a meeting and someone's talking and I don't like what they're saying, I tolerate it and I pray and I pray for I pray for God's power and love to channel that through me. Um, I take inventory on a daily basis. So what that means is, it's like a bit of a pen and paper exercise or, you know, there's apps and stuff like that now, but I'm a bit old school. Um, I look at, I reflect on my day and, I, you know, have I harmed anybody in my day, you know? So say if Neil's sent me a text and it's rubbed me up the wrong way and I've given him a call and I've given him what for on the phone and I, I look back on my day and I say, you know what, I was out of order there. What do I need to do to make that right? And then I, I will then go and make what we call amends. I mean, amends can be, you know, they can be simple, such as a phone call, you know, hi Neil, you know what, I'm so sorry for the way I spoke to you, I'll bang out of order, let me take you for a brew tomorrow to make it up for you, simple as that. Uh, and then, you know, I, I meditate once a day, and again, I use YouTube for that, there's loads of YouTube meditations out there. Nighttime, I, I pray, um, and I like to do a gratitude list at the start and end of every day, and a gratitude list is literally six things I'm grateful for when I wake up. And six things I'm grateful for when I go to sleep. And they can, again, be anything from, you know, waking up next to my partner, waking up, you know, and being woken up by my little girls. Or I could be grateful that I've got, you know, food in the cupboards. Or they can be, you know, I can be grateful for, for Neil asking me to come and share here today and let me be, be of help to him. You know, it's anything that I feel I'm grateful for, but gratitude keeps the spirit well. Yeah, I want to take this point to appreciate it. I'll do the same. Someone asked me, yeah, if I can help and I'm comfortable with it, I will. This is what I've had to get. So that brings me on. I'm just bear with this statement now. So we're the same. We, we are, we're both searching for a problem that we both had. It's similar, but we're different. Everyone's individual. But we follow certain patterns. We use a book. We have a program. We, we're, we're striving. We're striving to be good. But I've got, I forgot the question. I'm waffling that much. But um, <laughs> but you're different to me in the fact you what I'm not saying you wasn't on the floor when you come in because you've already stated you found God because yeah. you were at the bottom. But you hadn't financially. You wasn't dis destitute. I've always but I've always been financially destitute. Yeah, no. that's where we're... Yeah, and you know what? That's that's a common thing that people who listen right. I when I first came into a twelve step meeting. I did not qualify myself as a drug addict because I had 
uh, and a set of go-to guidelines as what a drug addict looked like, right? And, I mean, and by that, I mean, for me, a drug addict would either be someone that were homeless or somebody that needed to beg, borrow and steal to get high uh, and somebody that, you know, lived a very, very uh, low standard of life in terms of, like, hygiene and, you know, cleanliness and, and where they lived and, and what drugs they used and how they used it. And for me... You know, at the start, it was just, are you all right with me talking about what drugs? 100%. It's your interview. I just yeah, want to no, stress, course, I want course. you to whatever you're comfortable with. So for me, like I say, everybody knew I was a cocaine addict and I had a secret <laughs> a secret addiction on top of that, which was I was a religious crack cocaine smoker, a heroin user intravenously, and a prescription painkiller user I loved Everything from benzos to uh, tamazepines, lazoprams, uh, dark web for all you, you know, weird and wonderful prescription painkillers. But for me, you know, I, I had this question like, look, you know, I, I'm not broken. I'm not broken in the terms of financial. I've got my house, I've got my car and stuff. But we call it a rock bottom, yeah. And a rock bottom is not a, an intellectual debate. It's not something that we can... I can describe to you. It's just a feeling, a, a spiritual feeling that we have and... We don't know it's spiritual at the time. We only realise it's spiritual afterwards. But it's that feeling of, I can no longer do this, you know. And I remember mine, and I, you know, I didn't, I didn't qualify myself for, as a drug addict at the time. But I, at the point where I wanted to take my own life, and I took that into my own hands, and for me, that was my rock bottom, you know. And it doesn't need to be a, a financial debate or or an intellectual debate. It's just a rock bottom, and everybody's is different. But ultimately, the rock bottom is the point where we say, we, and I can no longer do this on my own. And that's where we normally find people reaching out for help. Yeah, and I just want to give my identification. So, like, this is not, and I thought it was for a long time, an academic exercise, get a book, study it, regurgitate yeah. it. And the other point I've just thought is, uh, oh, it's gone, it's gone, sorry. But, yeah, I do identify with that. It's not an academic exercise. Yeah. And it's, uh, I forget, I'll come back to that in a bit. So great, so okay, I want to get a bit a bit, a bit more identity with you now, that's good, that's it. Uh, so um, let me think what I want now. So if you could go back, so today, Ben who's sitting in front of me today, if you could go back to the Ben who's 10 and give him a, a little word, couple of words of advice on how to live his life, what would you go back and say? Well, um, that's a hard one, bro, that's a hard one because... Today, I honestly class myself and as a grateful drug addict. And I know if there's people out there that, you know, are still in the madness out there and they're looking at me thinking you're insane to be grateful to suffer with this. Believe me that there is a life out there that makes you grateful for it. But if I could go back, you know, I would, I would say the obvious. But listen, if I could go back and tell Ben when he's 10, don't touch that line of beak when you, when you can. I suffer with an obsession of the mind, don't I, that's, that surrenders around this program and that's what my addiction is and you know the second anything I, a second i have any sort of chemical whether it's drink or drugs has an effect and a change in me and so i don't believe there's any advice i could have given to a younger me because ultimately i suffer with that and without this solution that we have found i would never have overcome it so i believe i believe that this was always my destiny you know i believe it was always my destiny to to go through this and I think once you accept that that's when you can become grateful for being an addict because believe me I am a different person to what I used to be and it's given me gifts in life that I never believed existed you know and I'm talking non-financial gifts I'm talking gifts that you know spiritual ones and things that I would never have never believed I could have had in life now there was an I've, I've heard I've heard your story uh, I'll just keep it in that layman's terms there was an incident, so I'll tell you, that's how I'll word it. So, first of all, just just to start with, um, there's a lot of slogans get banned out. If you're entering into this world, fellowship and things, there's a lot of slogans. What's your favourite or what's your worst slogan? Which one stands out, which one do you hate? Oh, we all have, do we all have oh, an experience? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, I think we spoke about this one. So someone once told me, just keep coming back to which, which, which is a meeting, which... Which in in theory it's a good message in it. Just keep coming back. But to someone like me, knowing that all right, I can go out and I can use as much as I want, and then just come back and then go back out. That to me isn't a solution. That to me is like a merry-go-round. You know, I'll come back to this meeting on a Saturday. I'll go back out Saturday night. Friday night I'll get back on it. 
wake up Saturday morning, just come back to that meeting and go back out again. So for me, that was the worst. Um, Can I just come in and yeah, yeah, move on? So I identify with that because I done that was my that is a painful like anyone one foot in and one foot out yeah. is painful. It's just prolonging the agony. I'd rather, it ruins the party, and then you're all remorseful and yeah. you just and I, I've heard that slogan, but I've heard a sprint and keep coming back, but come back clean. Yeah, I prefer that one to yeah. go on and you know me. And do you know what? I, I've I've heard a lot in this, a lot in this. Do you know what the one for me was is so. We call people who've just come to who someone who's new in the meeting. We call them a newcomer. Yeah, and for me, this is one that's really prevalent in my life now. So, we I used to live by this saying, which was treat the newcomer like I treat my family. You know, but when you've got a couple of years in sobriety, and your life is no longer about the problems of drugs and alcohol, and you have to deal with life problems, I had a spin on it, and my sponsor, which we'll probably go into later, taught me the same, which was treat my family like I treat the newcomer. Because you know what, when when we get a newcomer to the meeting, it's so easy to make them feel welcomed, loved, and and show them that hope. Because we see them and we go, you know what, I was that desperate, I was that broken as he is. And we give them all that love. And so now I think, you know what, I need to show my family, my partner and my kids the same love and tolerance I show the newcomer at a meeting. Yeah, I like that. I've never heard that. So that's new to me that I like that. So, uh, what else do we want now? So, if you can give us a brief um, introduction in what, so a date, chronological, a date of your first meeting and what took you to that meeting. What was this chain of events that you went right? Yeah, so my very, so I'll add that I, I came into 12 Step Fellowship before I actually had a clean date. So, I came in around July, 20, no, around June, July 2019, just after coming out of my first rehab. And uh, it was a 12-step rehab, but I didn't engage in the meetings. I didn't engage with what it was going on. I used it as a detox, you know, to get myself off of the drugs. But the second I come out of the rehab, I was faced with the with life, you know. In the rehab, you know, I don't have my mobile phone. I don't have my money. I can't just ring up and score. So I'm in a bubble. I come out of that bubble. And I thought, you know, I'm going to go to a meeting. And I didn't, you know, because I didn't know what I suffered with. And I didn't know what it was like. And I hadn't had enough pain before I was ready to stop. So... My sobriety date is way after that. So, I mean, if you want me to go through the chronological before that. So, stuff. basically, so that, that's exactly what I want. But, like, your very, my very first meeting was in 1999 of, an, yeah, of another yeah, fellowship because yeah. my dad had just died. Yeah. Uh, and I was searching. I found a meeting and I walked in. and it, so, Yeah, I see, I, I did not find a meeting. I was, <laughs> I was told to go to meetings by loved ones around me, which... We're doing it for the right reasons, for the love of me. But yeah, it was Cocaine Anonymous, uh, Wednesday night, um, There Is A Solution. That was the name of the meeting. Uh, and that was around July 2019, after I come out of the rehab. Yeah, yeah, that's what I wanted, yeah. Um, so, okay, I'm going to give you the slogan now, and then I'll just say the slogan, and then you give your spin on it. Jails, institutions and death. Uh... What am I? So, so your, so your experience of jet, what it is. So, give a brief introduction to the layman and your experience of them three things. Um, I feel they're all institutions and jails. I feel they're all. To, to me, they remind me of rehab, man, because they're bubbles. Yeah, sorry. What I mean was so like, what's your experience of jails? What's your experience of institutions? And what's your experience of death? So let's get the jail. Sorry, we'll skip the job. Sound, yeah, okay. What about the institution? Uh, I, I've been sectioned, I've oh, been sectioned. Okay, yeah, yeah, God, yeah. Um, I loved it, yeah. I loved it because I was just doped up, man, you know. And all I wanted to, you know, my, my using took me to places where at the end of it, I just wanted to kill myself, and we'd end up sectioned by, I'd get sectioned by. A family member would get me sectioned and I'd be in there and I'd be fine because I'd be doped up on, on sedatives. You know? Yeah. Uh, death, my, my experience of, I've had a lot of experience with death, man. I've had it during addiction and I've had it in recovery and they are worlds apart, man. Worlds apart. But the, 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 the feeling, uh, uh, the feeling of the pain is the same, but how how I handled it were completely different, man, completely. Yeah, so I, you've just took me on to a couple of questions there. So what I was getting at initially, and you've took me on to my next question, is the the near-death experience you experience, if you don't mind sharing Oh, that. no, of course And, then, and then have yeah, you had yeah. grief in your life yet? Yeah, yeah. So for me, um, again, my using, there were no consequences that could stop my using, right? So I had a... Uh, 
I had a heart attack from from cocaine usage. I used to use steroids when I was younger, so I have a bit of a I had a heart problem, enlarged heart, and using cocaine obviously doesn't take a genius to work out. It's a stimulant, and I had a heart attack. But fortunately, I was in the hospital, and I was in resource. Come out of resource about two days, two days later after the resource and the incubation period, and I called the dealer to come and score to me at the hospital. Um, that was my first experience of near death and it did not frighten me one bit. Um, my second one was what I th felt was my rock bottom at the time, but it clearly wasn't. So I'd been in and out of rehab a couple of times. I'd been in and out of what we call the fellowship and the meetings and I just couldn't stop using. And my partner at the time had left me, had a beautiful home, had a plethora of drugs in front of me, right? And without even a suicide note or anything, I took an extremely large amount of heroin into a needle, mixed it with some kerosene, and I pumped it into my arm. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I believe God works in my life, because for no reason, you know, my big sister turned up at my door with the police, bust the door through, with the paramedics and the police, and uh, I, we, I think two shots of Narcan or Naloxone, I think they call it here, and uh, managed to keep me alive till I got to the hospital, I flatlined at the hospital, brought back in the hospital and I woke up after a brief in, uh, induced coma around 10 to 14 days later and my first thought was I need to get high and then my third and final time and this is a really personal one, um, I shared this when I did my, my story. Yeah, uh, this, this is what I didn't, I hadn't heard, I've I, I know the story a bit. It's the third one that, that I'd heard. That, yeah, that. so the third one was... So I, I didn't have a solution in my life. You know, I didn't know what to do. This was the day before my first... My, my, my sobriety date, as I call it. So uh, I'd been using and I was, you know, twisted out of my head, paranoid as anything. And uh, I made a phone call and I was going to ask for help. And it was to me, Ma, and she didn't answer. And I thought she don't want anything to do with me clearly. And so uh, I took a fire, I was put it into my mouth, cocked it back. And I believe that I was about to pull that trigger. Uh, and and I, I felt it, you know, there wasn't, there was no cry for help. I just wanted to go. And as I cocked, I cocked it back, uh, my phone rang in my pocket and it, it made me jump because I was passed out my head. And as I've done it, I popped the firearm up and it blasted a hole into my ceiling. And it was me ma calling me back. And she was like, you know, what do you want? And I said, please help me. Yeah, it's, it's the beginning. That please help is the, the beginning, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's exactly what I want. So you're at speed. Have you had grief in your life? If so, can you explain your take on it? Yeah, so I mean, for me, I struggled with emotions. You know, I'm one of them people that never showed emotion because, you know, emotion in my, my world was seen as a uh, weakness, you know. It was seen as a, a vulnerability, a way to exploit or to get the better of somebody, you know. Always had to remain, keep the image, keep the profile, keep the, the credit up, as we call it. And when I've had grief in my life now, it's completely different. Man. Like, I'm completely fine and at home with my emotions, you know. if I used to feel like I needed to feel something. I remember when my nan died, and this was during addiction, and... Everybody were crying and I didn't cry, man. I couldn't cry and I'm thinking, why am I not crying? And during my my sobriety, my dad passed away, yeah? And uh, I weren't crying. And, I, and I, I rang my sponsor and he said, you will feel what you need to feel. God will, God will make you feel what you need to feel at that time. So for me, I just feel like death during and after the sobriety date, they're two completely different worlds. Yeah, so there's a couple of points there I want to make. So I really identify, and I think Britain or England is, has a twofold. We have the male, don't show you the emotions, yeah. common in the rooms, but every male bar none's had that influence. Mine yeah, wasn't yeah. really that case, but still, I, I, I imposed that on myself, mm -hmm. and the English to stiff up a lip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know what I mean? So I think we have both sides yeah, of that. And, um, yeah, and um, so... So explain what grief done to you. What what it done in active addiction? What did it do? Uh, it made it all about me, doesn't it? You know. Yeah. Listen, I, and I still am this same person today. I just have 
a way of a way of life of dealing and making myself a better person, right? But during addiction, self-centered, egotistical, self-seeking, and you know what that means is everything's about me, right? So when people passed away, so my grandma died and um and and my uh, uncle, well great uncle, and that was an excuse for me to justify what I was doing. I'm going to get off my head tonight and my family can't tell me, you know, my partner can't give me a hard time, my mum can't give me a hard time. You know, the deal is I'm going to ring them and be like, listen, I need extra because, and I need you to give me a little bit on top because I'm suffering and you need to feel sorry for me. So it was always never about what other people were suffering with. It was always about how could I exploit the situation to better benefit me. Yeah. Now, we're kind of halfway, I'm kind of winging it with a bit all over the shop, um, but it's good, I like it so far. Um, so what I want to come on to now, like, recovery is a way of life, but what I needed, I fell short early doors on this, I was doing 100% recovery, I need a, a, an outlet, I need a, I need extra outside activities, I, I, to find my identity, to have a good time. For instance, I went dancing, I, I tried new things, I went dancing, mm-hmm. so what does Ben do now? And what what's one thing that you that you that you would like to try that you haven't yet? Yeah, man, you're hundred percent right, bro. Like, believe when you get into this stuff, it's easy to become like obsessed and and, and infatuated with it, yeah. Because we, it makes us feel so much better, doesn't it? And we yeah. become so we feel so well, and and we see the world through like a clear set of eyes for the first time. That we just want more and more of it, right? Because that's what I'm like with 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 my drugs. You know, I want more and more, and I can't get enough. And I'm like that with my recovery. So, like you were saying, that you know, I, I love I, I love to go to the gym. I love football. I love boxing. Um, I, I like playing the PlayStation. But kids, man, you know, they're the they're the bright spot of my life. My two girls. Yeah, amazing. Very similar to me in loads of areas. I'm a bit black in the gym, but yeah, I'm similar. Uh, one thing that you haven't done that you, you would like, I like to try new things because I'm still finding yeah, my identity. Yeah, 100%, man, 100%. Something you haven't done. Uh, I'm not what, saying you're going to do, but it's just like... Man, do you know what? I would like to... Uh, I'd like to go and experience like some sort of spiritual... Some sort of spiritual retreat in the world somewhere, you know, so, because all my travel in the world has been around, based around like the best party scenes and that kind of stuff. I'd like to go somewhere that's, that's you know, seen as a, a spiritual place that can just open open my mind and my eyes to new yeah. ideas, you know, that kind of thing. But, but I'm like you, but I'll try anything, you know. Yeah, yeah. Again, um, you, you do a bit of boxing as well, don't you? There's yeah. a few things, yeah. Um, right, what's my next question? So my next question is, um, so, um, what was your ambitions as a kid? What, uh, no, well, after that, when did you pick up your first, just give us a quick monologue of drugs, first date, and your behaviour around them. A quick, my, my drug a rough monologue. My drug log. So, yeah. for me, it started when I was younger with alcohol, you know, um, family members drank, and, you know, I have, I have got alcoholics in the family. Alcohol was the first thing for me, and fucking, I blacked out while I'm off my first drink. And I remember waking up the next day. I think I was about. Remember, I remember being at a school disco. Yeah, this is how bad it is at a spooky disco. And somebody had brought some like really bad, like really bad vodka, and I mixed it with a shandy bass. Yeah, and I remember, I remember the next day I woke up. So I'd have been what like 12, 11, something like that. And I woke up the next day and I was like, I want to feel that again. I want to feel that that euphoria and boom a bliss and then the next day wondering what happened yeah um after that it were I, I went on to weed was you know prevalent when i was a kid i never really had a major thing with weed but i say that but i'd smoke it every day but for me when around the age of 17 was my first line of cocaine bro and i, and I remember it you like it were yesterday i've got the same experience yeah and uh that just wow now, that took me to a, a place that I've never been before in my life. And I never got there again afterwards. That first, and there's nothing like that first one. But yeah, the, the cocaine first. And then with the highs of the cocaine came the need for come downs. And so I, I discovered, like I said, prescription painkillers from an early age around. I'd say around I'd say around the age of 17 to 19, I was just using cocaine and then alcohol to bring me down after a night out. From yeah. the age of 19 onwards, I would bang into Darzy Pan, to Mazzies, Alazzies. Um... And then around the age of 21, 22, um, I'd learned how to wash up and I took my first pipe, man. And if I thought that first line of coke took me to 
I'm not going to mention this, just absolutely floored me. Yeah. And then the highs of that brought me on to the, to the heroin. Yeah. And that was all, that was, that that spiral was around a six to nine month spiral. The second I took that first hit of crack, I were everyday crack, sniffing coke, heroin at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, this is kind of a package, but what, if you could pick one, what, tell us the experience and, and the reason and what was the worst substance to come off and why? Heroin, man. Was it? The heroin, a hundred percent, bro. Coca the cocaine come downs, aren't they? You know the the rough, and don't get me wrong, that feeling of needing to sleep, can't sleep, that feeling of dehydration, that feeling of irritable, and you know the only thing you know that to get rid of it is another one. But the heroin, man, it's just <sighs> the first time you take it, yeah, it's my mum's religious, and I remember telling her if I could tell you, you could kiss God, would you do it? And she went, yeah. So that's what that would like for me. After a few times of using it, you need it just to feel well. You know, the pains are unbearable. The sweats, you know, <laughs> the, what it does to your stomach, what it does, you know, throwing up. You've got bad bowels through the day. You can't eat. You can't sleep. And it's just, it's pain. And it's pain, drawn out pain. Is that the drug or the intravenous aspect or is it a mixture? Is the... I, I'd imagine it's it's the drug, isn't it? It's, it's the one drug where... Like I say, it, I can honestly say it was the one drug that I took it for a twofold reason, not just for the feeling of absolute euphoria and bliss, but to t take away that feeling of just, wow, the pain, man, like legs, you know, chest, hips, bum, all, everything's just in pain and you can't eat, you can't sleep, you, 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 you're itchy, you, you're hot, you're cold. It's just, you're just like a, a whirlwind of everything, man. And, and like I say... That fix no longer is just for the euphoric effect of getting high, which, you know, for me, that's what drugs are about. It's because I needed it to feel well. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, so what do we want now? So we'll kind of get a bit upbeat now. Where where does Ben see Ben in five years' time? Um, Hopefully married. We're engaged, me and my partner. So. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, I didn't know that. So, yeah, we're getting congratulations. Married. Yeah, we're getting married next year, bro. You're getting yes, married. Don't yes, worry. bro. So, yeah, married. Um, more kids, man. Do you want more? more? Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's, that's what I live for. Do you know what, Ben? I was just realised I don't even know your age. I'm 30. Wow, it's yeah, right. Yeah, I had a baby, man. Yeah, Bloody yeah. hell. Yeah. I'm going to, just to lighten the mood, I'm going to do this. Yeah. So, the first time I met Ben, I turned up at football. So it was my first time. I didn't know what was coming. I was unhealthy. I was a bit round the bend as well. And then you find, I saw Ben uh, warming up with a, with a mutual friend. And I seen the first thing I clocked was all the gear. He had proper pristine boots. <laughs> and I seen the hair and I seen the tats. And he had like a short that which he'd always wear. And I thought, what have you got here? And you were doing stretches and little touches. <laughs> and then when we played, you were like, yeah, I can see your style. You would have been a tricky winger back in the day. Like, <laughs> I'd like yeah. to think so. Yeah, no, but well, I did. So like, I kind of I was like, what have we got here? And I spoke, the first time I spoke to you, you spoke about boxing. I was thinking, oh, what have we got here? That, but it, it, the perception, that, that judgment I made, which was only a slight one, I didn't even share it with no one, but um, was totally off the mark, isn't it? That, that initial judgment. Yeah, do you know what, brother? Like, I, I used to like be so caught up on what people think about me like I needed people to like me yeah? and that's that's one of the parts of what we suffer with as an addict you know we need to feel loved and when we find people that like drugs we share that common interest but <clears throat> I've learned through being clean and sober not just through being a 12 stepper but through being clean and sober that I can't control what other people think and you know, what somebody thinks of me is no concern of mine. All I can do, if Neil thinks thought I were a twat and I behave like... <laughs> that's a, strong, by no, the way. No, 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 yeah. but you know what yeah. I'm saying? If you thought I were a twat and I acted like a twat, that's on me. Uh, yeah. But what you think of me and how I how I act and how I be, per, perceive myself to you is, ha, is how I choose to live. You know, people can make... I make judgments, man, but I've made terrible judgments. I've got to know people and I think, you know what? This person, I, yeah. I, I, I love this person. Yeah, yeah. Again, um, so what do I So basically, and it wasn't until because we played football and that, and like sometimes we're on the same team, sometimes against. We always seem to come up against each other. Yeah, I'm on the back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah, it's been a pleasant experience. But we went out for a coffee the other week, and there was a few things I wanted to talk about the coffee. So we went out for a coffee. 
You talked about criminality. Now I don't want to incriminate yourself. I'm not going to say any, anything about what. So basically, any, what 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 you've done, if you don't mind me saying, and we'll move on if you don't. No, no. Yeah. So you you were on the board of the criminality, but when you come into recovery, you wanted to stay clean but still sell drugs. Yeah, man. That's, uh, so, that's, that's common. That's yeah, common. Yeah. And do you you know think what? I'll stay clean? Make me because you don't want to give the money up. No. Nah, and do you know what? That's because. That's because I think at the time, you know, what we all do, we all think that drugs, it's the drugs that are the problem, you know. And don't get me wrong, they are the the, the, the initial problem. But yeah, I I sold drugs and I did from a young age. Um, and I found myself, if you can call yourself successful at it, I don't know. I mean... Yeah, yeah. I, I certainly I, wasn't it, successful, so <laughs> I, I, I you know, identify. I will, I will, because when I first started selling it, I, I, I wasn't a daily user, right? But I used, but... You know, I, I made money off of it. And so having drugs was never an issue because it was always about me. Um, but when I, wanted, when I wanted to get clean, yeah, I wanted to hold on to that lifestyle of image, what people perceive me as, you know, having that fear aspect so if, if I wanted to put, put that on people. And I wanted to carry that notion of my old life into my new life. And, you know, that's like trying to put the two two norths of a magnet together. Yeah, you know, poles, go separate yeah, ways, yeah. But... poles. Yeah, yeah, I like that analogy, actually. That's such sweet, that. Um, yeah, that sounds... didn't, didn't even rehearse that one. That was... <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I know. There's a lot of what we say. I've got to stress this. You've done, I've, in my opinion, you've done really well. A lot of stuff, we've said stuff before, by doing this stuff, you go through it, yeah. and you can just kick into the spear, but you had that was very... I like that one. I like coming... I go to meetings, and you're there, a lot of the same. It's weird, at different times, when you get sort of nervous to snip it. And when you let your head run and express yourself, that's when them gems come out. So yeah, really love that. Yeah, yeah so uh, what else? we want to talk about so um i want to talk football who's your team and why <laughs> yeah. right. so i'm i'm a man united fan yeah and i supported them in the glory days and i support them now listen um, so i lived in manchester when i was younger uh family were one half of my family were all leeds fans because one half of my family were yorkshire and Leeds were a team. They were ballers when I was growing up. Bro. I remember them. I remember Harry Keel, Mark Viduka, Alan Smith, Rio Ferdinand. Harry Keel, mate. That's what I'm saying, man. But I've always been a red, bro. Always been a red. Yeah, yeah. Had a season ticket, and um, yeah, yeah. I'll take. I'll support them through the good and the bad. Yeah, and um, yeah. So um, what you call? What you? I, this is just for personal pleasure. What you call it? Present take. What? How are you going to get out of this mess? How long is it going to take? And what have you got to do? Well, it's taken 10 years, hasn't it, since Fergie left and we're still in it. I think I think what everyone's saying about Ten Hag, he needs to be given free reign or he needs to have control over who comes through the door. He needs to have a full recycle of that team and he needs to reset that culture because people forget what it is. Mean, I remember growing up watching the likes of Roy Keane and Nicky Butt and they would leave it all on the pitch, you know what I mean? And I didn't mind us losing back in the day. It wasn't very often, but when we lost, but there's a way to lose a football match, man. And the way we lose today is, is spineless, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? If you get, it's not about the money, but if you're getting paid all that money and you're playing for arguably what I would say is the biggest football club in the world, you know, they're recognised all over the world, you will run that extra yard. You know, you will put that extra bit of effort in. And at the minute, these players just don't have that character. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. I don't want to talk out too much on football. That was more more for my personal <laughs> bit. That yeah, I'll do that to everyone. By the way, yeah, I'm not yeah. just picking on you. But uh, a question which I, we've not staged this, but I know you'll have pondered. I know it's been a fear at some point, and I'd like to know what what your answer is for for like at this present time, which might change. But I fear my children are going to be passed down hereditary the addiction. What you what's your take on that? What's your and how do you combat that? Yeah, but that's a hard one, man. Because like I say, I I grew up with uh, grandparents and a parent that was alcoholic. But obviously, I didn't know that when I was a kid, bro. Do you know what I mean? I just seen them that they like to drink alcohol. And then I've turned out this way. So, you know, you could look at it that way and say, well, that happened, so this is me. Um, listen, my kids will, will embark on their journey. And what I've learned today is I can only do what... God will have me do, you know, I can't, I can't save anybody from, from addiction, I know, I can't save somebody who comes into the room, I can give them my, my experience, and I can give them my, my experience and hope, and I can show them how I did it, but as for like, early intervention, I mean, yeah, of course, if it happened, bro, I'd, 
I've gone through brick walls to stop it, but at the end of the day, what will be will be. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah. And I, for me, the real I combat it is I, it's a fear, and I'm managing my fear. We've got to manage our fear in this game. I'm setting the example, I'm walking the walk, yeah, and we've just got to pray that if it, if they end up in that situation, that they say, Well, my dad's done it, so what do you do, dad? Ask me, and I'll tell them. And I couldn't even take the it's like similar, similar stuff. I'm a swimming, I was a swimming teacher in early in my life. And it was, I was used to really enjoy it, and I class myself as okay at it. But uh, this, there was a statement made then, I was only young, that you can't teach your own. So I'd have to take them yeah, to fellowship yeah. and let them embark, find their own feet. I couldn't muddy coddle and no. sit there, and you've got, to, you've got to get your identity. Think, that, that's my stance. I think know? one thing on that, right, you, and you've touched on it there, is all we can do is be clean, sober and present. Because if that does happen, you know, say if that does happen to someone in my life, what good am I to them if I'm still in that active addiction? Yeah, yeah. So all I can do is pay myself forward. You know, I've only got today promise. Tomorrow, it's no. Tomorrow is no is no promise to me. I've got this twenty four hours that I need to yeah. to stay clean and sober, set that example, and tomorrow I'll do the same again, yeah. and I'll do that. And if I do that every day for the rest of my life, I can be here and present to combat those things. Well, well you've done that with some varying degree of success for two and a half years, yeah, isn't well, it? That's it yeah. And again, I heard a statement the other day that I absolutely love, and I might have said it on how one the other the first interview, um, but uh, the world record in being clean is twenty four hours. Yeah, that well, my man, that, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I like that. Now, this is a bit of a trick question, and I'm speaking to the camera. It's not until we haven't staged this, but what is, what do you regress? Let's put it that way. Wow. Do you know what, right? So for me, I was full of regret because uh, my life revolved around money and I've lost a hell of a lot of money, you know, through, through this game. Um, I can, on, this is only something I've come to, I've come to terms with this, I'd say in the past six months. I'd say for the first year and a half of my life, I regretted hurting, you know, female female partners that I've had, you know, that, that I've regretted hurting them. And I mean, I don't mean physically because that's not what I'm about, but I mean emotionally, you know, uh, being unfaithful and promising the world, talking a game, telling them everything they want to hear and doing the opposite. So I regretted stuff like that. And today, don't get me wrong, I'm not proud of those things, but uh, we learned that we have to not regret the past you know, we don't shut the door on it, so I, I'd, I'd, it'll always be there. But I don't regret anything because, listen, regret it fills me with fear and fear fills me with anxiety and that just spirals and spirals. So for me, listen, I regret a lot of things I did, but that's not going to pay me forward, is it? There's nothing I can do about that other than going out and making my amends. That was exactly, that was why it was a trick question because I know once you get to a stage and you come, you come in with regrets, you regret well, yeah. you regret being born. You regret, yeah. Then, uh, but I regret walking to a meeting. There comes a stage, if you stick around and do the work, there comes a point where you get to the, there's a statement, one of the slogans, we do not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. So and that's why the trick element, um, yeah, so... Um, so, what do we want to hear next? So, we've got about 15 minutes left. So, let me think what we can do. Um, I would like... So, so again, out, so outside of recovery, you're on YouTube, so I'm presuming this, I'm trying to branch into markets. What, what do you think about the programme? Is data to what we do and, and how could it be improved into the future? No, I, I, listen, there's language in that book that's very difficult to understand, but that's... I think that's why we have sponsors, right? We have people that have gone through the book before me. There's terms in there, terminology that you, excuse me, that you don't understand off first first glance. But for me, listen, it, it's worked for me, so I don't want to be one of them people that, well, if it ain't broken, why am I going to fix it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, who am yeah. I? Who yeah. am I two and a half years sober to start rewriting at AA? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, it's yeah. been around since 1920, is it? 1920? I think 36, I think yeah, it was born. So the first, the, the mother's... The yeah, mother's the AA book, yeah, before yeah. that, yeah, the Oxford Group. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's been around a long time and it's worked for so many people. Like I said, like you said, there's stuff in there that we, we struggle to understand with, yeah. but I mean, that's why we have people that have experienced it before us. Well, my take, and I've done it today, I might have, and I apologise to whoever it is, I, I had a conversation with someone today, I won't, I won't break anonymity, but I work my own practice, so I, I'm branching, it. this is my form of branching out, I'm doing this as a vocation, this is just a little sideline, I still have to stick to them guidelines because it's proved, proven and tested, if I do it my way, I end up in trouble, I've been in a bit of trouble today, but yeah, um, right, I had another question, what was it? So, um, let me think, 
So what, if you could change, so I'll give you an example of mine. I've done this in the interview yesterday. I'll give you my example and see if you can just ponder it and see. So if I could change one thing of the past, now again, that's a bit of a trick because you can't change nothing and you shouldn't because it haven't happened for a reason. Yeah, yeah. But I would, the death of my father, if it spiralled my life, I would change that my dad didn't die in 1999. That's the one thing. If, if I could change one thing, what would you change? Do you know what, right, so... I wish I wish I could have got this when I first came into a meeting. That would be the one thing I changed because at that time, like I said, I hadn't I had done a lot of damage to people's lives on my own, but at that time there was a lot of things that were salvageable. Yeah. I wish that I could when I come out of that first rehab, I wish I could have come into one of these meetings, met somebody and wanted what they had. And that for me is the only thing I wish I could change because for me that was that was a moment in my life where you think you've fucking got, gone to the bottom and then you dig a little bit deeper, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and you yeah. kept digging and digging. Yeah. Well, when I heard your story the other week, you said something brilliant and I spoke to someone about it um, and I just want you... I'm going to state it and then I want your take on it and who told you and what it means to you. So, the, I'll just say the analogy quickly. It was a box put at your feet. Yeah, so... So explain it and tell us. So, obviously... When someone, when I came into this program, I, I found somebody that had gone through this 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 experience and wasn't just clean off drugs and alcohol. They maintained to get stay clean off drugs and alcohol, and they did the same for me, man. They laid what I like to call a spiritual toolkit at my feet, and you know they laid it at my feet. And the main thing being that I had to bend down and pick it up, and then put the action in. You know, nobody handed it to me. Nobody used the tools for me. They gave them to me. But I had to implement them into my life because you know it's it's no good having the tools and then never using them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I keep I keep having the question set, and then when we get to it, it's going. And it's, it's natural. Uh, yeah. So um, so let me think. So right. So we're on YouTube. We're working a program. We're using this to work a program, hopefully, and it's going okay. But then that that sideline, give us some YouTube plugs, some some extra curricular activity, like what you do and what you're advised to do. What in my program? It, so what you do personally? Yeah, yeah. So what? So give give us a few plugs on your YouTube because I know you're a big YouTuber. Aren't yeah, you? I mean I don't have a YouTube platform as such. Uh, something I've always wanted to do, man, but it's. Uh... I always find I always find excuses not to. Do you know what I mean? But I love the idea of it. Um, to stay clean, you mean that kind of stuff? Well, not like, like fun. Oh, fun. fun well, yeah. yeah. So you you told me you watch a lot yeah. of YouTube. Yeah, I, so. I watch a lot. Of, yeah, God, I love. So that. what do you watch? I, I do. You know, I used to love match of the day, but I can't get enough of watching football highlights. It's brilliant for watching sport. I love watching. Um, you know, just it's just fun videos. People that just do things for fun, man. I love like the side man. Yeah, and so what I'm getting at because you put me onto something I haven't had the the, uh, the link off you. What was that rapper? He's political. Oh rapper. yeah, so I've got some friends that, um, they, you know, they they had a, a very difficult time in life. A their mum died young, and you know they were they were grafted on the streets, and uh, they use YouTube as a platform to to build their uh, raps and now two two fantastic uh, rappers that are on spotify that kind of stuff but yeah they, they use youtube for that man and you know they rather than rapping about what they're doing in their life in terms of criminality and drugs they rap about like what they see the problems in the world to be on a bigger scale you know things like you know corruption at government corruption in churches um the failed judicial system you know everything from when you see, you know uh, rapist cases and drug cases being trialed the same and sentences being the exact same inequality in life black versus white all of these issues that like you know we know they're there but sometimes we you know we don't acknowledge it yeah yeah so again do you want to give them a plug so the viewers can find it have a look for it yeah so so they're called two brothers man i mean Two as in the number yeah, or two W L. Number two, yeah. yeah number two. Number two. Yeah. <laughs> so two brothers, I'll like, cause I'll I'll look at that when yeah. I get I always say I never go on I always say I'm gonna go on YouTube, I'm not bloody busy doing that on um, yeah. So a bit of tongue in cheek on this one. Cause it's something I'm embarking on. I've, I've toyed with the idea for for a long time and it's common in our game. Where'd you buy your smile from? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, because me, me mate's going to Turkey oh, and I, I'm gonna be going yeah, over. 
I get that all the time. Yeah, Turkey S- uh, Seville Smile Studio. Hook it up. Yeah, go on, give it a plug. Yeah, right? Seville Smile Studio. It's I'm lit. coming. I want our price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> look, her, look her up on Insta. Yeah, they're good ones. Yeah, them. I like them. She's, she's really but it's good common one. in this game. You come in and uh, they say it's miracles. What happens in these rooms? You grow your teeth back. You know what I mean? But it's really, really common. <laughs> I literally did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so. Okay, so um, just a little general question. What's wrong with the world today, the mm. modern world? God, man, I mean, I think that the, the, cost, of, the cost of living is just, is, is just nigh on impossible. I mean, I've, I've got two kids and a partner. We both work full time. We both earn a, you know, a good income. And we still struggle, you know, to run a car, to put petrol in, to insure it, to get the kids to school, to pay for school dinners, to pay for food. It's it's extortionate. I don't feel like the world is geared up to look after everybody. You know, I feel like the pe- the people that don't have jobs they suffer so much, and the and the government see them as a problem, bro. And it's like they're not yeah. the problem with this country, man. They're people that need help, bro. Rather than you know cutting payments down or cutting down on school dinners or payments, what you get all that yeah. kind of stuff. Those people should be lifted up in society to elevate them to give them a chance. Because listen, why do why do we turn to crime? Because we don't have opportunities, yeah. and that that's a common thing. I love that because I've never put it into terms, but I'm very I'm ex- on exactly Ooh. the same page as you with that. Um, so I'm just conscious of time. We've got through a lot of content. It's quite enough. Um, so. That's good. So I'm just going to wrap up now. So to wrap up, um, what would you give? It's got a couple of minutes. What would you say? So the person's coming on YouTube for the first time, one piece of advice to the newcomer. On this platform, yeah, I might man. add. So you, you've clicked on this video. So my guess is that you're looking for help. You're looking for answers, yeah. And for me, listen, it worked for me. And there's no reason why it couldn't work for you. Listen to what listen to what we spoke about, and if you can identify with it, if you can hear something in what either of us has said, or the way I think, or the way I feel, or any of that, yeah. Talk to somebody out there. Find a meeting, man. Find a meeting, or find somebody who's suffering and it, who suffered, sorry, and is no longer suffering. Ask them how they did it. Do your research. No, that's what I did. I needed to see see it work in so many people before I believed in it. Yeah, and I do want to stress this is a digital platform. Um, this is online. This is in your own comfort, your own home, at your own leisure. Zoom but just, isn't it? The Zoom as well. But for me, there's no, there's no, not not can replace the physical aspect. No. Going to a physical, physically face to face, like we're doing now, on the screen, you don't quite. But get do you know it. what? Doing it this way, like you're doing it, bro. There'll be people out there that want to take that step yet yeah? they want yeah. to go into a meeting but it's scary isn't it yeah yeah or you might not think am i as bad as that and you might look at me and think you know what i use like he did you know it made me feel that way he yeah. took and then it might push you to make that step all right i'm dragging out. i'm going to i'm going to finish on this my last question so i think you can go on we've got we've got eight minutes so as long as you want so what, because I will know my experience, I could talk for quite a while on this. When we first come into this way of life, you told you're getting a life beyond your wildest dreams. What did you think that was at first? What do you think it is now? <laughs> and where do you think it can be? I thought my life beyond my wildest dreams was to live my lifestyle, but control my using. Yeah, I, yeah. Th- I wanted to go back to when I was younger, where I could go out on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday stop and then be all right Monday to Friday and, you know, just use control like a normal person. That's what my thought I was going to get from it. What I've got from it, bro, something I've been searching for all my life, yeah, which is peace of mind. Yeah, it's peace of mind. Like, I go to bed at night, yeah, and I know that I've done my damnedest to not harm nobody. And if I have, I've promptly put it right. I ain't put a chemical in my body. I haven't let anybody down. And I've, I've tried my best to be as rigorously honest as possible. And that is a gift that money cannot buy, bro. You know, kids, you know, smiling, happy, partner that, you know, I can go and went to watch the boxing at a friend's last night and, like, knowing that I'm going to come home on time when I say I'm going to come home on time. Because these are all things we take for granted, didn't it? You know, I used yeah. to say I'm nipping to the shops and not come back for seven hours. And, yeah. you know, I could go out last night, come in at half 11, 12, and there was no 21 questions. It was get in bed and go to sleep. So for me, that's the biggest gift I've ever had is just peace of mind and, and being present and, and of service to people in my life. But Yeah, really. 
Brilliant. So, right, I want to shake your hand. Thank you for keeping me one hour, more one hour clean. Um, so stay Thank clean you, out there, folks. We've watched this video and you haven't used, you're an hour clean. So put 24 mm. of them together, you've got a day. Um, there'll be plenty of content on this to do that. So, yeah, so thanks. So with that, this is Neil signing off. How?